Hi, and welcome to 2023 belated Happy New Year. This video is all about the Packard Bell Corner PC that I managed to acquire just before Christmas. I won't lie, it turned out not to be very cheap to get this thing up and running and buy all the missing bits, but it's an iconic thing. Also quite a rare thing by the looks of it, which is probably why I spent a bit more than I normally would on a used PC. I mean, looking around for videos on YouTube, there's a couple of videos uh, I think the Nostalgia Mal channel had a few videos about this machine and LGR had a video about this machine but I think it's the same machine Nostalgia Mal lent it to LGR to cover but apart from that they seem to be pretty rare. So I jumped at the chance having never seen one become available before and we're going to take a look at it now. So googling for information about this thing does not reveal much. I found the small sort of commercial for it which gives you the price range at least, so it started at $1,399 and went all the way up to $2,999 depending on which version you got. Since that was the only bit of information I could find with the picture, I went leafing through my own magazine collection and I did actually find something in this Christmas 1996, December 1996 edition of Practical PC and it was news, big news, coming up this a whole range of multimedia PCs that Packard Bell were about to introduce and there's a nice picture of this corner PC there and yeah so that was pretty much all I could find out about it. The machine arrived just before Christmas a couple of days before I had to go away for a few weeks to spend Christmas with relatives so it wasn't really till a couple of weeks ago or a week and a half ago when I got back in the new year that I actually got to play around with it. So to begin with We'll take a look at the monitor. So it's clearly one thing glaringly missing here is the speaker on the left hand side is not there. And the one on the right hand side has a rather fetching coat of rust on the metal grill. The other thing that I didn't see when I bought it was there's a scratch on the screen. A relatively deep scratch too, so hmm, we'll have to see about that. Let's swiveling it round the backs in pretty nice condition. There's some yellowing on the speakers and the front sort of bezel is very yellowed. So it looks like it was made in 1996 as the magazine article suggested and when I bought this the guy on eBay kind of suggested that he thought this might have been made by Atari though I can't find anything to confirm that. Yeah I don't have any monitors like this that has dials for everything so there's no crappy on-screen menus to to get your image aligned on the screen you just use these dials at the bottom which is super handy and I like it. We've got the original keyboard and mouse. The keyboard actually came with it and looking into it this model actually was made by BTC and not by Packard Bell. I don't know if they made their own keyboards or not. Um, popping a keycap off it, it just appears to be a rubber dome and slider affair with a sort of cherry fitting for keycaps which is kind of handy because it opens up a whole range of replacements but not mechanical which uh, it's not the end of the world because this one actually feels quite nice. It's quite clicky and quite responsive and feels quite tactile. So this is the mouse and this did not come with the original eBay purchase. I had to find this separately on eBay also. Unfortunately, none of these in the UK, so I had to get this one in from the States and I think it costs more on postage than it costs for the actual mouse. Turns out to be one of the more expensive ball mice I've ever bought. And then to the iconic cheese slice of a base unit. Uh, this one's slightly different to the other YouTube videos. Those were labelled just a multimedia, whereas this one's labelled an executive multimedia. So I can only take that to presume that this particular model was aimed more at offices rather than the home. On to the first of these protruding appendages from this crazy machine. So we've got our labelling here that I mentioned before. So we've got executive multimedia. Uh, we have the obligatory three and a half inch floppy drive. And then they've got this cr these two crazy bezels. The first one here just doesn't do anything. It looks like a CD opening sort of tray or something, but it just contains the two LEDs for power and drive activity. And down the bottom here, we've got this button that looks like it ought to eject something, but that's actually the reset button. So yeah, nothing really fancy going on here at all. Mm, it's not fastened properly. In the middle there, we've got this kind of crazy cylindrical sort of decorative thing, which has got the Paco Bell logo on it. 
And then on the other protruding, overhanging thing, we've got the drives themselves. So we've got our CD drive, and I guess hiding below that bezel at the bottom, there will be a hard disk drive, but we'll find out in a sec. And at the bottom right, we've got the power button itself. Spinning her around, we can see the model, which is an executive multimedia 924C. I googled that, nothing specific to be found. Looks like it was made in France, eh? Made in France. Usual power supply. Usual array of I.O. PS2 for mouse and keyboard, serial port, parallel port, and a VGA. Now we've got some expansion cards in here, which could be interesting. So this is funny looking thing here. I'm not sure what that is. And then what looks like a combo modem sound card. Only one way to find out. Let's open her up and take a look. Outer casing's entirely plastic and looks like it's just held in by two screws. And it looks like this grey sort of cylindrical bit in the middle just slides out and doesn't really serve any purpose other than decoration. Once the two screws are off you can just pop the bezels off and then the case lid just lifts right off. Needless to say, the first thing you notice when you open it up, it's filthy. So it's going to need a good clean. So first thing is get these LEDs. There's a, a fan sort of housing that's loose in here. So that's case fan that plugs into the motherboard. So we'll get that out of the way. Lots of dust in there that needs cleaning up. And then there's a couple of wires coming in from the bezel that hook up the LEDs on the motherboard. And then we can get that out of the way first glimpse inside here it's all looking quite familiar and that's because a while back I bought uh, a, a bare motherboard a second-hand motherboard I never managed to get it working but it looks very similar to this it was a Packard Bell motherboard it was a socket 5 motherboard and it had a Pentium 75 on board but it had uh, these cards these exact cards so I know what they are before even looking closely so I'm guessing that other motherboard I got is also from a one of the multimedia range, if not another corner PC. Um, I'll have a look at that at another time, but I know that this is an M-Wave combo modem sound card. The M-Wave cards were developed by IBM, and I think they put them in Aptiva and some ThinkPad laptops. The earlier versions, the IBM versions, were notoriously buggy as far as I'm aware. You don't hear about them much when you sort of Google around sort of retro hardware. I don't think they're very well thought of, but this particular one I know is a later card. It's a Miro card, a Miro Connect 34 Wave, which is a later model and I believe the drivers were much more stable by this time, so it's going to be interesting to take a look at this. Removing the sound card reveals the little card below, which I know also is an Aztec radio card. So I think that was kind of paired up with these cards in a lot of machines, I guess, because they were aimed at sort of business kind of telephony sort of office kind of work that they included the radio card so that the operator could you know, listen to tunes in the afternoon while they were sort of doing their data entry or whatever. Pop the riser card out and it looks like we've got four expansion slots here. We've got two ISA one PCI and then one in the middle that's either or. So either three ISA and one PCI or two PCI and two ISA. I'll take a look at the individual bits of hardware shortly, but in the meantime, it's just going to be a case of doing the usual, get the drives out, get the cables out of the way, take the memory out and get the motherboard out. And I think uh, originally I was going to give everything a bath, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to do my usual lazy IPA and mop up the dust kind of approach so that I don't have to wait a day for it to all dry. And we'll just crack on and take a look at the individual components after that. And the very last thing is let's get this heatsink off and a bit of prizing. The processor does come away so it's not glued. A lot of baked, gunky thermal paste there but at least it came off so we'll have to clean that up and take a look at what we got. I've been away and sprayed everything down with IPA and given everything a wipe with kitchen paper and cotton buds and everything is acceptably clean now so here we have everything assembled and ready to take a look at. The motherboards come up reasonably clean and we can take a look. The first thing I noticed was it's got uh, 
a surface mounted BIOS chip, which is never great for backing up, burning and flashing. So hopefully that'll be okay. And this one is a socket seven as opposed to the socket five on the other board. And it has onboard graphics, so Cirrus Logic, GD5440, and I guess that's one meg of RAM with expansion to add a second. And this is an Intel 430FX chipset, so this is going to be a non-MMX motherboard, and I think the maximum speed you can run on these things is 200 megahertz. I believe this was also the first chipset to support EDO RAM, so I guess that's what might be on board. Okay, so we've got the Myro sound card and the little radio card from Aztec, I believe that is. So the Aztec radio card plugs in to the sound card and presumably it just receives the radio signals from the aerial that's plugged into the little socket that's on the faceplate, and then that feeds the radio through the sound card so that would be something that's possibly interesting to see if we can get that going again and then we've got the Myro sound card itself so this has got like a plug-in component which is the modem part of the card so I guess I could actually take that modem off if I didn't want it on there but I'm going to leave it on uh, it's like a software modem it's a, a 28.8k modem and it also does fax at 14.4 there's a CD-ROM interface on there as well. I believe it's either Sony or Mitsumi. Not quite sure which one this would be. It runs on the M-Wave MDSP 2780 chipset. And these things, they didn't use uh, synthesis for your MIDI music like you would get on sort of contemporary sound cards. So there's no OPL or equivalent going on here. That These were pretty early sort of sound font cards so i guess similar to the all 32 when all that kind of thing started kicking off so they actually run the the samples off software rather than using a synthesizer then memory so there's two sets of chips here two different kinds i guess one of them was the original kind and looking at the other videos on youtube i guess it's going to be these ones with eight chips on the side and then somebody's added uh, an upgrade. So I'm guessing that it's e all EDO RAM, EDO RAM, and probably 16 megs upgraded to 32. A Panasonic floppy drive, so nothing really exciting there. We've got a Mac Store hard drive, uh, guaranteeing us total customer satisfaction. We'll see about that. And I'm going to guess, given what this machine is it's probably going to be in the one one and a half gig range i guess it's the original hard drive because it's uh, manufactured in 1996 as well and this is quite a nice cd-rom drive this is an nec drive and looking it up the cdr 1300a it's a six speed drive so quite a nice early relatively low speed drive but probably not so slow as to be extremely painful to use Cleaned up the bezels, so the labels there, got our Intel inside Pentium processor, remains to be seen what speed that is. And speak of the devil, here's the chip, and it's a P120, so, you know, no speed demon. Uh, I still haven't quite decided what to do with this, but I guess the 120 was aimed at the office environment. I presume that they, they put out faster chips and uh, sort of more game-worthy chips and maybe went up to 200 megahertz on some of the sort of higher spec ones. And there it is, all the internals laid out, ready to put back together. Okay, so it's just a case of doing everything in reverse and putting the thing back together now that everything's clean and let's see if we can get this thing to work. The last thing I did before I broke up for Christmas and disappeared was to give it a quick boot and see what was what when I first bought it to see if it worked. And I got it to post, no problem, and it went into Windows 95, it would boot into safe mode, but it wouldn't boot into Windows 95, so it had some kind of, you know, driver error or something like that. And I did go into safe mode and have a bit of a fiddle before Christmas, and really the only driver that was on it was the M-Wave driver, and I removed that altogether, and it was still just 
hanging on the flash screen of Windows 95 when it went in. Uh, I just kind of gave up. I thought it was not worth it because it was, you know, there wasn't even a Packard Bell sort of factory install on the machine. It was just looked like a sort of fairly minimal version of Windows 95 with some Office stuff on it. So I sort of left it and decided to wipe it. So that's what we're going to do now. Now I've downloaded some images of uh, Packard Bell factory software and we're going to try and install that and hopefully see if we can get that to work. Did it work? Did it hell? <laughs> to cut a long story short, not to quote a Spandau Ballet song, not that I'm a Spandau Ballet fan, but it didn't work because it kept on losing sight of the CD drive. So it would load up, it would say it recognised the CD drive, so it seems that all of the stuff on this machine is original because the restore disk recognises the CD-ROM driver, it recognises all of the components as they... That it has the drivers on the, the Packard Bell boot disk. Um, the Packard Bell discs seem to come in pairs, so you get the boot disk and you get the, the CD to read the information off, and you have to use them together so that they can talk to each other. But every time it would go through, it say, yes, I recognise the CD-ROM there, yes, I recognise that the restore disk is in the CD-ROM, and then it would say, I'm unable to find any files to load. So I googled all over and apparently it was a fairly common problem all techies used to have this at the time and the answer was just to go through and hack the the config sys and auto exec dot bat to ignore the auto detection of the Packard Bell CD-ROM and just load in a standard CD-ROM drive which I did and just use oak cd-rom.sys and find cdd.sys as well and it still just gave the same result every time. Now it's possible that there's something else going on here, I don't know, but it does sound like a common problem. But I, in the end I decided it's just not worth a hassle because it was just out of curiosity that I wanted to see all of that bloatware that Paco Bell will put on here. But I think it's probably something I'll come back to at some point, but for now I just decided to load vanilla Windows 95. And once Windows 95 was on there, there's only really one piece of software that I wanted and that was the drivers for the M-Wave sound card, the Myra one. So I went specifically looking for those and installed that as well. Uh, I also managed to get a copy of Works 4 off the Packard Bell discs and so I, I've got a few things on here. I haven't seen that it's booting okay, I haven't tested the sound yet but we'll do that in a second. It's time to just put the fascias and all of that crap back on and, and let's get this damn thing into a corner. <laughs> the one thing I did see in, I think it was the LGR video, um, the guy tried to push it into the corner and it wouldn't go because obviously on one side you've got your VGA cables all sticking out and stuff and LGR noticed it wouldn't go into the corner because there was too much cable interference. So I... I've managed to kind of get some stuff. We've got a right angle power cable and I also got a right angle VGA adapter. So the only kind of things that are really sticking out are the two PS2s for the mouse and keyboard and they're relatively flexible. But ideally, if I can find right angle adapters for those, you should be able to get this thing pretty close to the wall. Um, what I'm gonna do, I'm going to revisit this machine. Basically, all we're going to do in this video is just get it up and running. I haven't really decided what I'm going to do with this, but one of the things that I will do in the next time I video it is to try and find some kind of right angle solution for the PS2s. And if I can't find one, I will try and make one. And then we should be able to get this thing snugly into a corner. There you go. It's in the corner. The keyboard and mouse are plugged in. This desk isn't quite pushed right into the corner so the PC can't be pushed into the corner either without falling off the edge but you know I think it would go pretty close to the corner if it was but it's all clean and sitting looking very corner like. <laughs> In the meantime let's turn to the last remaining thing which is the monitor and yeah we've got that scratch to deal with. I have sort of dabbled a little bit there are some hacks for this like clear nail varnish, car body scratch remover and stuff like that. I'm going to try a bunch of those and see if I can reduce this and but I haven't even looked really to see how it looks in general use. I don't know if it's a problem when the monitor's on and you've got the light shining through from the back whether or not it really bothers you or not but you know there's possibilities there to try a few things and 
depending on the results of those, I might get to the point where I think about maybe doing something like getting some of that diamond paste and possibly trying to polish it out and get rid of it altogether. But things for the future. In the meantime, the only thing we're going to deal with now are these speakers. And look here, some new speakers. Well, new second-hand replacement speakers but at least we're going to have two speakers and we'll be able to get rid of that rusty manky crappy one that's on the right hand side of the monitor at the minute unfortunately these speakers that i bought the replacement speakers came with a fitting kit and they need this kind of spacer because these screws are kind of weird they have a threaded portion at the bottom but they're not threaded at the top so if the the countersink on the speaker isn't deep enough, they will just go through the threaded portion in the monitor body and then spin, which is exactly what they did the first time I did it when I forgot to put the spacer in. So I've got three spacers and four holes. One of the speakers is going to be fine. The other one is probably going to flop around a little bit at the bottom. And the way I'm going to deal with that is I've got some kind of transparent gel tape. Now I did use this alone to secure some speakers onto the side of another pack of bell monitor that I covered in another video. So I'm going to pop a little bit of that in on one of these speakers, which means it probably won't be quite flush but it will be secure and that's all that really matters so that all went relatively smoothly and now we've got a vastly improved monitor with two balancing speakers and no rust in sight and then it's just a case of flipping the monitor over so the left speaker hooks up to the right speaker the right speaker goes to the sound card output and these are powered speakers they don't take power from the monitor so they have an external power brick and that needs to be plugged in also on the master speaker on the right hand side <laughs> the exciting bit all that remains now is to flip the thing over connect everything up and let's see what this thing looks like in the corner That looks exactly like a corner PC auto look to me. So let's fire it up and see if that sound card works. Cool, got sound. Uh, I'll have to test that out with some games later on. I'm not gonna do that right now. And yeah, the next thing you get is the M-Wave card, which I guess is aimed at business, comes with this sort of built-in answering machine stroke fax machine stroke telephone answering thingamajig, which I guess is what it was often used for in an office environment. And here we've got the aforementioned version of Microsoft Works for Windows 95 version 4.0. And you can see I copied over some wallpaper and I also grabbed the logo and the information from the other Paco Bell machine I've got so that when you go into system properties, we've got that as well. So despite not getting the system store disk, it's still kind of Packard Bell. It's got that Packard Bell feel. And apart from that, all we've really got is the M-Wave software so there's some cool little things in here like you've got this little map <laughs> many times with creative sound cards in the past you have to go off and dig out the manual or turn the pc around to try and figure out where you need to plug various things in so it's nice to have a little map and yeah it plays wavs fine and yeah it's all working pretty well just a basic install but the machine is up and running and that's what really counts so I guess that kind of wraps it up for the video. We've replaced the missing parts like the speakers and the mouse and cleaned it up and got it working and all installed, which is kind of all I wanted to do for now. I haven't decided what I want to do with this yet. You know, not being able to get a sort of MMX processor in there. I don't know if that makes much difference. Um, I don't know if I want to upgrade it and mess about with it, change the sound card or leave it as it is, but it's kind of looks so cool. I kind of feel like I want to keep it out, but I'm going to have a think and I'll definitely be doing another video and doing something with this at some point. But in the meantime, that's it. It's working. It looks awesome. And I hope you enjoyed watching it come to life. If you did, it'd be great if you consider giving me a thumbs up or subscribing and leaving comments below. And I hope to see you on the next video. Thank you very much for watching. Bye.